Finally, in both Canada and America, there has been a lot of political debate about debates. In the US, the controversy centers around the Republican presidential primary. Everybody agrees that there should be some kind of debate among all of the people who want to win the GOP nomination to take on Hillary Clinton. The only problem is there are so many of them. According to the New York Times, there are currently 14 Republicans who are either currently running for president or are considered likely to begin running very soon. And according to other media gossips, there are at least six other highly plausible candidates as well. Could you imagine a debate with 20 people on stage? Assume the thing was scheduled for two hours and everybody got a one minute opening and closing statement. Factor in moderator introductions. Basically, the thing would be half over with just the hellos and goodbyes. In Canada, meanwhile, questions are swirling around this fall's prime ministerial debates, which are currently being negotiated in anticipation of October's big federal election. How many party leaders should get to participate? The big three, obviously, but what about the Greens? And what about the Bloc Québécois? And what about that other weird Quebec party that no one's heard of? And what about the Libertarians? And what about the Communists? In the recent British elections, they had seven party leaders on stage. Is that a good standard? The problem with political debates of this sort is that there are no good standards. Any system you use to determine who gets in and who gets out will be inherently arbitrary and thus on some level grossly unfair and undemocratic. In America, the Fox News people have said that they will only host a debate with the top 10 Republican candidates as determined by recent poll numbers. Unfortunately, at this early stage, the poll numbers are basically useless since all of the many candidates are basically equally popular, which is to say they're all polling at somewhere between 1 and 15%. Ordinarily, when you want to exclude unpopular people from a debate, you look at the candidates whose numbers are so low that they have no realistic chance of getting elected. But who is to say a candidate polling at 2% has less of a chance than a candidate polling at 5%? These are the sort of margins of exclusion we're talking about here. Now, sophisticated political observers understand that regardless of where anybody is polling right now, some candidates are destined to emerge as more serious contenders than others. For example, Donald Trump is polling quite well at the moment simply because he is more famous than, say, Carly Fiorina. But the sophisticated people know that Donald Trump is never actually going to emerge as a serious presidential candidate because, of course, he's an idiot. But it gets a lot more difficult when you try to decide, well, is Dr. Carson a more serious candidate than Mike Huckabee? Who gets to decide that? In Canada, meanwhile, things are no less confusing. It seems likely that Elizabeth May, the boss of the Green Party, will get to be in at least some prime ministerial debates, but it is not clear why. The Green Party says that they should get to be in the debate because they have two members of parliament right now. But so does the Forces et Démocratie party, this weird Quebec thing. They want to be in the debate too, but they almost certainly will not be. Nobody really knows if the Bloc Québécois will get to be in the debate, but of course they have two seats as well. Since the two Quebec parties only run candidates in Quebec, you could argue that it is mathematically impossible for their leaders to ever become prime minister, and therefore they are not serious candidates and should be excluded from the debate on those grounds. But even though the Green Party is running candidates everywhere, their poll numbers numbers are so low, it would not be difficult to argue that their leader is not a serious contender either. Anyway, in both Canada and America, the underlying question is how do you prevent advantaging some fringe people over other fringe people? You obviously leave the fringe by gaining more public exposure, but at what level does a fringe person prove themselves to be sufficiently non-fringy to leave the fringe? Are the fringe fringy in the first place because they possess some inherent fringiness? Are they basically so dumb or radical that it makes sense that they would be unpopular? Or are they merely normal folks who have had fringiness thrust upon them by some sort of conspiracy to convince the public that they deserve to be on the fringe? Perhaps by excluding them from debates? And is it the media's job to attempt to cure fringiness or merely accept its existence? It is because people have such different answers to these very subjective questions that the debates in both Canada and America will inherently be somewhat randomly organized. All of this serves to reveal one of the big paradoxes of democratic politics. Since it is impossible to ensure that everyone has equal opportunity to communicate, it is impossible to claim that we have a political system in which voters are making perfectly well-informed choices. At the end of the day, we simply have to accept that a certain level of unfairness in our politics is inevitable. But don't be sad, there is still a silver lining. The next time that you're irritated that your political candidate of choice is being excluded from a debate, don't fret. This simply means that you get to voice your outrage using any sort of wild argument you want with no respect for consistent logic or principle. Because when it comes to organizing debates, none ever exists.